My uh, daughter, Danielle D'Souza Gill, is in town. And you know Danielle, she's the author of The Choice, The Abortion Divide in America. She's also the host of Counterculture with Danielle D'Souza Gill. It's on Epic TV. And uh, we thought we would talk a little bit about uh, the hearings and Katanji Brown Jackson. Um, I'm afraid that this is a woman who's going to probably make her way on the court. Now, she doesn't alter the balance of the court, but she is going to be on the left. I mean, in a group of leftists, she's going to probably occupy the, the, uh, the uh, farthest position on the left. Uh, what do you make of her, of her statement that she couldn't even define what a woman was? Well, I think that this just shows what Marsha Blackburn said, which is that this is how radical she really is. She really is just a far left wing progressive and even further than any kind of traditional progressive we would think of because she can't even acknowledge anything in the realm of feminism because she doesn't even know what a woman is. So she's obviously solely focused in her mind on the trans issue. But I think that um, hopefully, I hope that people like Mansion, Cinema, and others will see this as she is so radical. So please send this back and bring us back a more moderate Democrat or maybe someone who is left wing. But she is another level of left wing that is not acceptable. I mean, what you're saying is that even feminism is too right wing for her. She's feminism not... is too right wing for her because she doesn't acknowledge that there's a such thing as a woman, even though she was nominated because she was a woman. She herself is a woman, but she clearly doesn't know that. So I don't even know how she identifies herself when she's, you know, marking her gender on a paper or things like that. She doesn't know what woman is. And I think interesting, Ted Cruz kind of had her sort of up against the wall where he goes, listen, if if identifying as a woman makes me a woman, he then goes on and says, he says, well, I'm Hispanic American. Now, what if I identify as Asian American? Can I sue? Uh, do I have standing to sue um, on the basis of discrimination against Asian Americans because I identify as one? And of course, she was a little flustered by this because after all, if, if gender is a completely subjective and fluid category, why isn't that also true of race? In fact, you could ask of Kentanji Jackson, how do you know you're black? Mm. And I think, too, is sometimes we think in terms of race, you know, we shouldn't view race, right? We view everyone the same. We want things to be based on merit. But that's not even what she was saying in terms of gender, in terms of, oh, you know, it's OK, like we will treat men and women the same. That's not even along the lines of what she was saying. She was basically saying that womanhood doesn't exist. She's basically stamping it out as opposed to saying people are equal. So I think that she's mostly focused on, you know, forget women, forget that. The new thing isn't feminism. It's the trans issue. Gender it's, is it's, optional. Yeah. One of her radical mentors is uh, this professor at Harvard, uh, the, now dead. His name is Derek Bell. He's one of the kind of gurus of critical uh, race theory. And I'm just going to read from Katanji Brown Jackson. This is from a speech she gave a few years ago. She goes, my parents had this book on their coffee table for many years. She's talking about Derek Bell's faces at the bottom of the well. And then she says, I remember staring at the image on the cover when I was growing up. I found it difficult to reconcile the image of the person who was smiling with the depressing message that the title and subtitle conveyed. The subtitle is something like the permanence of racism. Uh, and then she goes on to say things she, that she goes on to some reflections about the civil rights movement. Now, number one, the thing that's interesting is that this book was published in 1992 when she was a student at Harvard. Mm -hmm. That's probably how she encountered Derrick Bell. But this whole notion that she stared at the book on the coffee table while she was growing up is a clear fabrication because it didn't exist it when didn't she was exist, growing yeah. up. Right. So this is a case where I don't know if memory plays tricks on you or if it is the case that uh, all these race activists invent storylines uh, which are detached from reality and then they become somehow convinced that that's the way it was. And so just as history for them is twisted out of recognition, their own memories are too. Exactly. And she even has a different story about her parents that I read. She basically said Clarence Thomas reminds her of her parents. So then that would mean that her parents wouldn't be reading this woke book. They wouldn't be reading this, you know, Marxist book. They would be, be more uh, traditional people. They would have a different view of race and so on, similar to what Clarence Thomas said. So I don't actually know which one is true. Maybe her parents were these woke people or maybe they were more traditional people wondering what the heck happened here. Why is our, you know, 
his daughter becoming woke at Harvard. I don't know. But either way, I think they just make up whatever story works for them. And talking about making up stories, to give you an idea of how whacked out and crazy this Derek Bell character is, he has in the faces at the bottom of the well, he has a story, a fictional story, science fiction. It's called The Space Traders. It's actually made into a movie. So here's the basic idea. Invaders from outer space come to Earth and they tell the Earthlings, we will solve all your problems, the deficit, health, environmental problems on one condition. You have to agree to sell black people to us into slavery. And Bell goes, yeah, man, you know, people struggled with this, but they decided to go for the bargain. And so he ends the story uh, with black people being kind of packed into uh, into these spaceships and being sent off. Now, uh, let me read read from him. On the dunes above the beaches stood U.S. guards. There was no escape, no alternative. Heads bowed, arms linked by slender chains. Black people left the new world as their forebears had in, had arrived. Now, I think to myself and I think, you know, what what's going on here? This is not just dystopian fiction. Like, this is a reality that could happen. I actually think it's imaginative, wishful thinking. And by wishful thinking, I mean these are guys who kind of want to revel in slavery. They want to keep slavery alive. It's the opposite of what Martin Luther, Martin Luther King was keep hope alive. These guys are like keep slavery alive. And what they, what I mean by keep slavery alive is as long as slavery is at the front and center of the American imagination, it's like pay up time for the population, right? Uh, so the way to keep cashing in on slavery is to keep the wound in people's sight even 150 or more years later so you can continue to collect workman's compensation. Yeah, and I think that's definitely the left's goal, and that was Obama's goal, basically re reigniting racism, reigniting these kinds of flames from so, so many years ago and making it out like, you know, everything about you is only about your race. Um, just to kind of make people even more infuriated, I guess, and to keep people voting for Democrats. But then I think you know, like we kind of said with the gender issue, but then what is their goal with that? Even if they want to make it so you can never escape your race, the only thing about you is your race. This is clearly holding you back. That's what, um, you know, Miss Jackson would say or whatever her pronoun would be. But then it's like, well, then how would you view that as, as gender? Why is it that, that that is something you've suddenly thrown in the trash? So I think it's a real double standard. It's a, this is an affirmative action generation we're dealing with. If you read Derek Bell's book, it's sort of, uh, you can see this is a mediocre intellect. How do you end up at Harvard in the first place? I, happily, Harvard denied him tenure. And then sure enough, it's like, I'm being denied tenure because I'm black. Even though there are plenty of other black scholars at Harvard, Orlando Patterson, Randall Kennedy at the law school, many others. So the point is he's being denied tenure because he was mediocre. But all these people have cashed in on race. And in some ways, they've even cashed in on gender. And so, as you say, it's ironic that having done that, they didn't turn around and go, gender? What? Gender? We don't know what that is.